No, I mean, I mean, at any given point, at any time, this is the general uh, representation of what what will happen. So the the curvature becomes greater as you go towards regions of higher density, basically. And uh, you can think of the curvature as being represented by how close these uh, these lines are. And so as your matter density becomes greater, so for instance, if there is a white dwarf, or, uh, then your curvature becomes greater and greater. Until what happens is that you reach a point where the curvature becomes so great that there is a region that forms, which is called the horizon, and no matter, no light can escape that region. And so when you have such a region, you get a black hole, right? So this is from uh, the movie Interstellar, and uh, the graphics in this movie uh, were apparently, uh, they were advised by uh, Chip Horn, who was one of the you know, big names in black hole physics. And so you can see the bending of light around the sun, around the black hole, right? And so this is one of the characteristic effects of general relativity. So general relativity describes the bending of space-time, but because of its of the weakness of the gravitational interaction, its effects are only visible on very large scales. So if you say, if you ask me, well, is it, does it have an effect in this, in, this, in this classroom? I would say, well, yes, but you would require fantastically sensitive instruments to observe those effects. Now, so, Gravity and generativity describes the very large. Like it describes cosmology, uh, it describes galaxies, and so on. On the other hand, the very small is described by quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, well, again, we most of us know this this uh, this history. Uh, that quantum mechanics was born out of the failure of uh, classical theory to describe. Uh, phenomena associated with uh, black body radiation, among other things, and the stability of atoms. And the resolution was suggested by Planck in his quantum hypothesis that uh, atoms emit and absorb light in certain discrete radius only rather than in any other free wavelength. And then in the early 20th century, Einstein's theory of the photoelectric effect and Moore's atomic model, he's confirmed and established this hypothesis. Then he probably came along with his theory of wave uh, particle duality. And in finally 1925, quantum mechanics was born uh, with the birth of the matrix mechanics description of Heisenberg born in Jordan and the Schrodinger equation of Schrodinger. Now, then you have Heisenberg who comes along with uncertainty principle and Dirac unified quantum mechanics with special relativity and he gave the theory of the Dirac equation which predicts this new, new particle called the positron which was observed. And in 1940s and 50s saw the development of full-fledged quantum field theory, quantum electrodynamics, final diagrams, and then later on the gauge principle, non-abelian gauge theory was introduced. All of this eventually took full form in the, in the form of the standard model of particle physics. And the structure of quantum mechanics. So why am I telling you all of this is again to provide some background and some motivation for why we should care to connect quantum mechanics with gravity at all. Why is it important? Right? So to understand why that is important, we have to first understand what has what what do these different uh, fields have, what they have managed to explain, and more importantly, what it, what is it that they have not managed to explain? Right. So whereas quantum mechanics describes uh, explains many phenomena in particle physics beautifully, there are also many problems. So to understand those problems, we have to look at the structure of quantum mechanics. And 
In quantum mechanics, physical systems, any physical system, even the universe, is described by a state, which is just a vector in the equal space. Observables are described by operators, which are just matrices. And then the Hamiltonian for a general many body system would have this form, where this is a kinetic term, this is a potential term. And a lot of people talk about a theory of everything. Right? So string theory, the theory of everything. Well, in many ways, the theory of everything is right here. <laughs> now, so one of the most important consequences of this uh, structure is the superposition principle. It's the notion that any arbitrary linear superposition of two states is also a valid quantum state. And it is this fact which leads to issues when one tries to talk about quantum mechanics in a gravitational setting. So what are some of the difficulties with this, with quantum mechanics? One is the measurement problem, so-called measurement problem. Uh, how does collapse happen? Right? We say that there's a system and it exists in some superposition and it is evolving in time. But when we measure it, it gives us the system ends up in some eigenstate, and but we don't know. Why it ends up, things that ends up in that eigenstate and how it ends up in that eigenstate? What is the process? We don't know, we have no idea. So many people think that well, gravity has some role to play in this collapse process and that you know quantum gravity is what explains this collapse process. Then another aspect of quantum mechanics, which is something that is is present, but you know, because it's always there, you don't really know. Right? And that is background dependence. In other words, quantum mechanics, as we normally use and understand it, requires a scaffold, uh, a structure, on which the quantum states are defined. So the structure most commonly is some space-time. So quantum states are functions on a space-time. Right? They are functions of x and t. They can also be written as functions of, of momentum. But again, you need a momentum space to be able to define those, uh, those states. Now, in a general curved space time, it becomes unclear how to define position and momentum in an invariant manner. Because when you have a general curved space time, you have general activity, you have. Uh, General relativity obeys uh, invariance under coordinate transformation. So when you go from one set of coordinates to another set of coordinates, what can happen is that a state, which is a pure state in one coordinate, can become a mixed state in another set of coordinates. <laughs> this is, for instance, the origin of some of the more interesting phenomena of quantum field theory in curved space time, which is uh, the rule effect. Now, there is no need for a scaffold. You can always define quantum states. Quantum, you can do quantum theory without any reference to a scaffold. You can think of a quantum state which describes just an abstract property. This is, for instance, the basis of the famous Schrodinger's cat notion that you can have a property that a cat is dead or a cat is alive, and that our cat can exist in the superposition of these. So you can think of any abstract uh, property. You can say that uh, there's a state which corresponds to something being red and something being blue and something being green. And those could be your basis states and then your system could exist in some superposition of those states. Now, now that's fine, but the problem is that then if you start with quantum mechanics, you do quantum mechanics without any scaffold, the question is, how do you get the scaffold to emerge out of that setting? Right? Because we have to end up with some sort of a space time, we have to end up with some sort of a dog tree. Right? How does that come out of some quantum mechanical system which is not defined for any existing scaffold? Right? It's like I don't have this floor 
to, to stand on. Right? So, uh, what is, what is, you know, the, the, uh, the expression is that space-time is a stage on which physical phenomena happen. Right? But the problem is that if you have a stage, uh, you, you want to do quantum gravity, you want to be able to do, describe physical phenomena without any reference to the stage. Right? So you can see how that might be a difficult problem. Now, the description of elementary particles requires quantum field theory, which is essentially when you go to quantum mechanics with infinity is a freedom. And this has many well known <coughs> problems uh, involving. Uh, Divergences with ultraviolet and infrared, and then you have many techniques to deal with them, like renormalization and uh, cutoffs. But again, these are all uh, techniques which do not give you a complete quantum theory. Right? So, what they, sort of invariances are you to be demanded? Invariances are what? I mean, is this a great? I mean, as you go from one frame to another frame. Right. We cannot define something which is invariant. Right. Which quantity would you want to remain invariant or frame dependent dependent? Well, yeah, okay. So, um, relational quantities. So, ultimately, the things that, that are the, you know, observables in quantum gravity are uh, so, for instance, uh, the, the relative separation between, let's say, two events, right? Or um, uh, what I mean, spatial separation. Yeah, spatial. No, I mean, I mean, again, no, I'm talking about like spatial separation. I'm talking about, you know, I'm trying to explain, uh, I'm trying to understand what Rao's question is. Like, right. I like, uh, are we demanding some kind of, uh, sort of, to look at some, you know, observing some interactions? So, okay, for so example. I, I'm talking about NPG. In NPG, what we demand, we start with diffeomorphism in general. That is a requirement. That is what leads to the structure of our, of our state space. So that is a requirement that uh, the quantum states that you define are uh, independent of the, you know, the background of it. Okay? So you want to be able to define the geometry itself in terms of quantum states. Rather than having quantum states which live on a certain point. Right? To, do, to be able to do quantum gravity, to be, you need to be able to do quantum geometry. So rather than just having quantum fields which live on a space-time, like you want to be able to describe quantum fluctuations of the space-time itself. Okay. So then the question is, how do you do that? How, can, how do you start from uh, an abstract quantum me mechanical metaphoric system? How do you emerge, how do you get some kind of a smooth continuous space time in some approximation from that system. Right? Such that a, you know you have some notion of class category that, that is restored at some at some stage. Right? But of course ultimately all of these uh, symmetries that you know we apply for the field theory like Lorentz transformation, Lorentz symmetry, diffeomorphism equation, all of these symmetries will, of course, turn out to be approximate. And quantum gravity will lead to violations of these uh, symmetries in some limit. Okay? So that is what people you know, are using to investigate uh, these different theories. So maybe as I go further, I have a question now. Yes. So I can understand what is meant by quantum state defined without reference to a background scaffold. Yes. 
Great. So, I mean, you can see, you, let's say you talk about the state of a free particle. Okay? It's a free particle. Where is this free particle? It's on some segment, line segment. Right? So, that is that line segment is your background scaffold. Right? It's a function of coordinates. Exactly. So, it's a, it's a function of coordinates, right? But then, when you have a theory of gravity, your, your coordinates themselves, uh, you need to have uh, freedom, uh, coordinate independence. Your, your physics should not, your, your physics should uh, describe, uh, give a quantum description of the coordinates themselves or of various geometric quantities that are constructed out of uh, the coordinates. So we we'll see that. So then, why do we want a theory of quantum gravity? Well, because the hope is that many of these difficulties might be resolved uh, if we try to uh, combine quantum mechanics and general relativity. So there is a standard model of particle physics, which is unified strongly and recommend the interactions. Of course, this model, even though people are justifiably proud of this, it is ugly as hell. If you look at the standard model of Gandhi, it doesn't look like anything which you know would be a gift from God. It's like you know one page long, and there are about 15, 16 free parameters, and nobody knows why those parameters are the values they are. Some people take comfort in anthropic reasoning, saying that this is the only universe where we could you know. Uh, exist, that's why these parameters are what they are. But again, that's not a very satisfactory explanation. Right? Because by that reason, you don't really need to do anything. But, and then you have the standard model of generativity. This describes large scale structure, nucleosynthesis, this describes how the universe came about. But this also has its problems. Right? It doesn't describe, tell us really what happened with at uh, the era of inflation, uh, it doesn't tell us what happens in a, inside a black hole. It doesn't tell us how to give a description, a quantum mechanical description of black hole evaporation, right, which maintains uh, unitarity and preserves probabilities. For example, do you have any model Yes, yes, you are know, you are right. I, I did think about that. I, I did think about writing cosmology, but then I was like, mm, yeah, I'll give you, you're right. Minus, minus 10, minus 10. So both of these descriptions are incomplete. And the description of the universe, for example, at, at very early times, will necessarily require a quantum description of drama. And the reason this will be the case can be seen already in Einstein's equation. So, Einstein's equation, so these angular brackets are expectation values, right? So, when you have matter fields which are quantum, they will, be, they will have quantum fluctuations. So, you can't really define some energy or some momentum. What you can do is you can take expectation values of those quantities, right? But if there, if there are fluctuations in the matter fields, then that will imply that there, is, there are fluctuations in the geometry also. Right? And, and vice versa. Now, if your geometry is fluctuating, then the question is how do you consistently define quantum fields on a fluctuating background? Right? Again, there's this thing that if you have a scaffold, now you imagine the scaffold is changing, how do I define states on this changing scaffold? Now, so there is QFT on globe space time, which is very successful. But again, it's not quantum gravity. Right? It is just quantum field theory on a curved background geometry. And then there are many successes, you know, it describes various phenomena. But then it fails the moment you enter a large curvature regime. 
What is Andro effect? Hmm? Andro effect. Andro effect is uh, the statement that if you have an observer who is accelerating, that observer will uh, measure a thermal bath path purely because of their acceleration. Thermal path? Yes. Yeah. So, so, so I am here. I measure the vacuum. Vacuum has zero temperature. I start accelerating. I will. If I have a detector, it will start registering some response. Of course, the effect again is quite fantastically small. So nobody has been able to. You know. So you said thermal detector. What is it? Huh? What? What detects? Sorry. What? What it detects that detector? Well, presumably it would, you know, detect all sorts of bad things. Right? Uh, with some probability which is related to the mass of that okay? So the at a given temperature, right, you would have some sort of thermal distribution. Right? And the different states would be distributed according to the probabilities created by the relative you know, portion over the probability vectors. So whereas Hawking radiation has been observed in uh, analog systems, in optical fibers, and in uh, acoustic systems. So, all of this tells us that quantum description of geometry is inevitable and unavoidable. And finally, new discoveries lead to new technologies and new modes of thought. Right? Within 30 years of Maxwell's unification of electromagnetism, the world had changed. Right? We went from an era of world living with candles to living with electricity, right? And we all, all we are still experiencing that change, which is happening so rapidly, right? So quantum gravity is the epic intellectual quest of our time, right? So if you're up for an adventure, then quantum gravity is the thing that you might want to look at. So what are some of the obstacles and unsuccessful attempts for quantum gravity? Well, the first attempt was you know, made by Feynman and other people. They tried to treat the metric as a field, which can be quantized. Right? But again, the problem with that approach is that you can only, you have to again assume that there is a fixed background. On that pitch background, there are some perturbations of the metric, and you are quantizing those perturbations. You don't really have a non perturbative description of quantum phenomena. Then there is string theory. Now, string theory is a beautiful theory. You know, one has to admire it. But to say that it is a theory of everything or a theory of quantum gravity in the form it exists right now is incorrect. There is a vast number of factors we call the string landscape. This happens because the symmetries of the string world sheet require uh, the world volume, the volume in which the string moves to be 10 or 11 dimensional. And then to make that correspond to a four-dimensional world, you have to take six of, of those dimensions and you have to wrap them up. You have to so-called compactify them. The number of compactifications is of the order of 10 to the 500 or something like that. So each compactification corresponds to a different universe, a different reality. That's known as a string landscape. The question is, where are we in a string landscape? Right? So again, this seems like a problem of excess. In many ways, it is similar to the ultraviolet catastrophe that happened, you know, that happens when you ignore the quantum nature of light. And I'm, I will argue that the string landscape and these other problems are because of ignoring the quantum nature of geometry. And most recently, right, this is June of this year, papered by Kumaran Mahapa and Hiroshi Koguri and other people, right, so these, these are like String oracles. Rahul, you must have heard of these things, right? I think they have like 
they did a big earthquake. So again, I'm not an expert. So maybe like there is some completely trivial reason for completely ignoring these. But what they seem to say, huh? Like supporting this or? Yes. So first, let me just summarize. So what this says is that in this string landscape, there is a swamp land. What is swamp land? The swamp land is a set of solutions which are inconsistent. And I precisely don't understand what that inconsistency is. And let me tell you straight up that I am very far from being an expert in anything. So uh, there are actual experts in here, here, and I would be very happy to have my arguments completely demolished by them. So, but what I understand is that according to what they, they have said, is that universes with a positive cosmological constant live in the string swampland. Meaning that any solution that corresponds to our universe is inconsistent. Right? So string theory cannot possibly describe our universe. This is just like mind blow. After so many promises have been made of achieving the string theory, right? We find out that it was all one big blue Right? But no, that's not correct. I, I don't agree with that. And if I did agree with that, I wouldn't keep giving you this one, right? Because I'm talking about unifying string theory with this particular. Not in getting rid of string theory. So the unstated assumption of all of this is that space time, there is a smooth pattern of space time at all. So the unstated assumption of this of, of the string of string theory is that there is a smooth world volume in which the string is propagated. And that the string world sheet itself also has a smooth intersection of it. So NQG is the only approach to quantum gravity, which gives you an alternative feature. Then there is also a very big movement going on right now, which started long back with Sakharov and Bogovic, and more recently with Jacobson, but the lab of Virginia is single by that shock method, which talks about how geometry emerges out of the time. Now, this also syncs up very nicely with the picture that we get from it, but that's a topic for another day. So, let me give you a very brief outline of the PG and uh, Again, you find constraints, you can't go into, can't simplify it beyond a certain extent, but feel free to buy really expensive copies of my book uh, and read up on that. Uh, or, of course, I don't get any royalties, so, uh, uh, but you know, it helps me up my thread with the publisher. Or you can just download the archive version. Either way, so what LTG is, is there's a phase space which consists of triads and connections. So you can just think of these as uh, generalizations of an electric field and uh, the vector potential of electromagnetism. These, uh, this vector potential and this electric field, they satisfy some sort of normal Poisson brackets. And this uh, electric field actually is the square root of the vector. You can take two copies of this, contract it with itself, and you get a copy of the vector. This is in three dimensions. Now, to construct gauge invariant observables, you for you can use this connection, and you can integrate this connection along uh, a path. And that gives you a holonomy. And this holonomy is uh, just the phase change uh, or the phase shift that is induced uh, due to the presence of this uh, vector potential. And this is very, this is essentially what happens in the alarm of warm effect. Right? So the presence of a non-dual holonomy around a 
closed loop measures the presence of a flux to that loop. Right? The difference is that in this case, that flux is not a flux of, of some field, it's a flux of what we will identify as geometry. And these triads, uh, they can be uh, integrated over two dimensional surfaces, right, to give us uh, these uh, momentum variables. And essentially, what these correspond to is this corresponds to the area of a two dimensional surface. And the resulting state space, the quantum state space, has the form of abstract graphs. So now we are getting close to that goal of getting rid of the scatter. Right? Rather than having states which are defined on some three-dimensional manifold, we have states that are defined only on, on graphs. And moreover, these graphs are abstract. We don't need to have reference to any background manifold to define them. And each edge of this graph is labeled by a holonomy for a group element, which is this uh, variable here. And then we can use something called the Peter Weyl theorem. Now, the Peter Weyl theorem is actually quite straightforward once you understand it. It is simply the statement of uh, the Fourier transform of functions which are defined on groups, on group manifold. Right? So you, when you have a function which is defined on uh, the real line, for instance, the Fourier transform gives you uh, an expression in terms of uh, functions which are labeled by momenta. Right? Here, your states are functions on these graphs, and each edge of this graph is labeled by uh, this group element, which is an SU2 group element. And what this measures physically is when you go around a closed loop, it measures the curvature of the region, of the space time region, or the spatial region, which is enclosed by this field. So putting together all these different regions, you have a sort of a sim simplicial or discrete approach to constructing your, your map. And so your, your states are now functionals of these group elements. And that is your configuration space. Now to go to momentum space, you use the Peter Weyl theorem. The Peter Weyl theorem allows you to take any function which is defined on a group manifold and write it, expand it in terms of the Fourier coefficients. The Fourier coefficients are nothing but the angular momenta of that group. So, for the case of SU2, for instance, uh, the Fourier coefficients would correspond to SU2 spin limits. Right? So, this is your, uh, so to speak, your configuration description, this is your momentum description. Here, now your edges are labeled by spins. Okay? So, you can think of this as one element of your uh, Fourier or momentum space. And you can consider superpositions of graphs like this to give you uh, states in the configuration. Now, graphs of this form, they are known as spin networks. And these spin networks, they turn out to have some very nice properties. One property is that each edge of this spin network carries an angular momentum. Now, we can ask what is the action of various kinds of operators on these graphs, on these graph states, right? One of the operators that we can define is the area of a two-dimensional surface. What is the area of a two-dimensional surface, or any surface? It is just the integral of the volume element, which is the determinant of the metric. Now, this determinant can be expressed in terms of these tetrads or triads, 
And since the triad is canonically conjugate to the connection, right? So this is like saying that uh, your momentum variable in quantum mechanics can be written as a derivative in terms of the position. Here, your momentum variable can be written, or operator can be written in terms of a derivative with respect to the field connection. And all of this, by the way, uh, machinery is exactly what you find in uh, if, you, if you do chronology quantization of the electromagnetic field or uh, non linear gauge field. And what you find is that the action of this momentum operator on these phenomenies can be explicitly calculated. Essentially, what happens is that when you act once on a phenomenon, you get one factor of this tau i. What is this tau i? This is just the poly spin matrix. So these connection variables you will see, they have a spatial index. A normal vector potential you know has a spatial index. You have a zero, one, two, three. But this is a non abelian Huh? Why? Uh, well, because if you you know you, you start with because LQG starts with this ADM decomposition, ADM or the three plus one decomposition. You start with a full four-dimensional manifold, three-step manifold. Then you uh, slice it into three-dimensional spatial slices, right? And then you're talking about the geometry of these three-dimensional slices. So the so the symmetry, the full symmetry in the four-dimensional space uh, time is SL two C, the Lorentz, the local case. And when you restrict, when you take a timeline direction and you restrict yourself to the spatial manifold, that SL two C reduces to SU two. You also have momentum which is based on SO. So, uh, so this vector potential is a non-abelian vector potential. That means, in addition to a spatial index, there is also a group index, I, right? And in SU2, you have three elements, sigma, sigma y, sigma z, or tau x, tau y, tau z. And so the action of this derivative gives you one copy of this poly matrix. And in terms of this operator, I can define an area operator. An area is, what is an area? It is this determinant of this metric. This determinant can be written in terms of two copies of this triad. So triad can be written in terms of derivatives. And each, so I get two copies of the derivatives. Each copy of the derivative gives me one factor of a poly matrix. And all the delta functions and everything, they result in the in this expression, right? Which is just the uh, the Casimir operator, right? So when you take yeah. Newton's constant, ah, uh, Newton's constant, uh, it came from uh, here. When you write uh, this, the phase space, uh, when you write the, the for some brackets we think the phase space variables, it's in this uh, kappa. Kappa is 8 pi g. Kappa okay. is 8 pi g. Okay. So that is like a postulate, right? No. That can be derived? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is, this is pure canonical gravity. There is nothing, nothing postulated about it at all. Because an experiment says that they are not postulated, absolutely independent of the theory. No, 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 they are not. See, you have a. Gravity, you have two descriptions. One is the first order description, one is the second order description. Right? In the second order description, you only have one independent variable, which is the metric. Right? In the second order description, what happens is you say that the metric and the Christoffel connection, both of them become independent variables. Right? But then what happens is you solve the equation of motion, and when you solve that, you can express the Christoffel connection as a function of the metric. And you can put that back in and it becomes the second order. So here what what we are working with, we are working with basically the first order composition of gravity. So the torsion is actually Ah, torsion and all is, is 
that, that's, so torsion, of course, has to play some role in all of this, but again, that's separate. Uh, yeah, in that uh, Poisson bracket, yeah. why should that be uh, identified with Newton's constant? I mean, that means it somehow presupposes. No, no, because because see, you're 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 starting with um, you're, you're starting with uh, Einstein Hilbert action of of general activity. Which I think you are starting with ADM. Well, you start with the four-dimensional action, which is the integral of the which is stable, right? And there's a factor of Newton's constant out in front. Ah, so you take the Einstein Hilbert action as a starting. Exactly. Okay. Okay. You, you are starting with pure general thing. It is evaluating everything in terms of Exactly. I mean, there's nothing, you're not changing the structure of the theory anyway. That's what makes it NQG compelling in many ways because it is, you know, very, very conservative. Okay? Any other questions? So, what this does is this these two derivatives you, you get two factors of the poly matrices, right? And then the delta function basically give you sigma squared or tau squared. The eigenvalue of tau squared when acting on an angular momentum state is nothing but j times j plus one, right? Where j is the angular momentum carried by that edge, this edge, right? So you start with uh, the uh, ADM connection, ADM formulation. You go to the uh, first order description, right? Then in the quantum theory, you find that the states have to be these graph states, <coughs> perhaps kind by homologies. Then you do a Fourier transformation to get these spin network states labeled by angular momentum. Then you look at the action of this operator on the angular momentum. States, that action of that operator gives you that each edge carries a quantum of A yeah. of And then you can think of an arbitrary surface, right? And so when I say surface, I mean a surface which doesn't have any joint. Doesn't have any concept of area. And then you take some arbitrary graph state, and you have all these edges which intersect that given surface. And whenever they intersect that surface, they give you one quantum of area. Right? Now, so this is quantum geometry. I don't want him to miss the next slide. So, um, can we just take five minutes? is that uh, the degeneracy 
is turned out to be proportional to the ADS. So this gives you a first principles calculation of the Beckett sheet Hawking entropy of black holes. Is it the exact answer? Exact answer. Now, string theory. String theory is the cartoon version. Somebody, I just had an awesome idea. Suppose all matter and energy is made of tiny vibrating strings. Okay, what would that imply? He says, well, I don't know. Of course, the cartoon version. Now we have the serious version. What is uh, string theory? String theory is basically a theory of a string a one-dimensional extended object which is propagating in some background space-time and this is graph big figure smaller than it should be and there is some area element of this string worksheet and so this surface traced out by the string is called the worksheet the volume in which the string is propagating is called the world volume Described by they have two different actions. One is the first order action called the Foley Fog action, and the other is the Nambu-Goto action, the second order action. Now, the Nambu-Goto action is actually very simple, very ridiculously simple. It is actually just the area of this world. And so, essentially, what this says, of course, this is a very small sector of string theory per se. This is the you know, bosonic string only. Right? You would have, if you had told me all you get super symmetry and super strings now. Okay? So I'm making no pretense of throwing out the connect all of that. Right? But what I can say is that the form of the Namakoto action is very, very, very suggestive. That there is a very simple way in which you can get a, such an action from an HPG perspective. And what is that? Perspective. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll skip all this long. We think that string theory and LPG should be combined. There's lots of prior work, and there are various aspects of string theory and LPG, and there are various uh, parallels between the two. And I just want to mention this note by Ashok Sen in 20, 21 years ago. He, in his paper on string networks, he talks about. Uh, string networks, and he says that at present, the utility of the string network is not clear. However, in future, a manifestly SL2 gene invariant for derivative formation of string theory may be, may, would be possible. This would be similar in spirit to recent developments in phenomenal gravity, in which loops have been replaced by spin net. So, of course, I would be very hesitant to go up to him and ask him how he feels. I don't think he feels very positive. But I think this was a very efficient observation. And so essentially my claim is that the string action, or at least the Nambu-Koto action, can be understood very simply and very straightforwardly as the expectation value of this area operator of LPG acting on a certain graph state. So the picture is this, that you don't have a single string, this is very important to understand. This effective action emerges from the dynamics of many strings interacting with each other. And so you have some strings which are moving in a background, some abstract background again. Now as the string moves through this background, it encounters other strings. When they encounter encounters other strings, they intersect. So what is happening is, as it is tracing out its world sheet, right? That world sheet is being intersected by these other strings in its neighborhood. Every time that there is an intersection, you get a quantum of area for the world sheet, right? So instead of having a smooth evolution of the string, there is actually a discrete step-like evolution. Right? And 
And so your string word field is actually should be thought of as in in this way, where this blue suffix is actually your string word field. And these are all the other functions produced by all the other strings in the system. Yes, yes. Yeah. So let me just finish. <laughs> So, so that is my conjecture. And there is another uh, prediction of this that there is a parameter in FPG called the emergency parameter. And if you compare the dimensionality of the number of action and this expectation value of the operator, what you find is that well, there should be a, there instinctively there is a tension. There should be a similar tension parameter in the quantum gravity. And that's a proportionality constant of which it should be this energy parameter. And it's a good time for speculation. And this is my baby. So with that, uh, I